our backs were against when our backs were against the wall and it looked as if it was all fine you made made a home and we're standing and we're standing here only
Good morning, Church of the City. How you living? Y'all doing all right this morning? Let's stand up and worship together. Father, we've heard of your fame. We stand in awe of your awesome deeds. Would you renew them in our day? Would you do it again in our time? i 
that's your spirit we want this morning. So pour it out, so pour it out, pour it out, pour it out. This isn't performance this morning, God. This is a petition, God. We're asking for your spirit, for your presence. Make it messy. We want it, we want it, we want it. We want it, we want it. It's you, it's you, it's you, it's you. We want it. Let it rain.
surrender all. Let's say that again. You can say it with me. Your way, you say. Your way, your time, your time, your will, your will, not mine, not mine. I surrender. I surrender all. If that's your prayer this morning, can you help me say it again? Your way, your way, your time, your time, your will, your will, not mine, not mine. to worship as we prepare to receive communion. I want to take a moment to pause before we do that to just acknowledge and pray over the escalating conflict in the Middle East. Would you pray with me, Lord? Lord, 
We pray for those impacted by the attack on Israel. We think about the innocent people and families caught in the middle who are living today with fear, anxiety. Be near them, Lord Jesus. Pray for the leaders that they would have wisdom beyond human understanding. We pray for your people, Lord, gathering today to worship you in the place where the church began. We ask that peace would prevail. We ask this in the holy name of the Prince of Peace. Amen. I mean, you guys could take a seat. In Luke 6, we read these words of Jesus. He says, No good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is known by its own fruit. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. Well, as we prepare to come to the Lord's table, I wanna invite us all to take a moment and just reflect on the past few days of our lives with this question in mind, what kind of fruit has my life borne? As you remember the past few days or the past week, and interactions come to mind, people you spoke with, places you went, did you find yourself bringing more love and peace and grace and patience and gentleness to those places? Good fruit? Let's take a moment, quietly invite the Spirit to search us and reveal to us any bad fruit we bore this week. Let's ask him to forgive us. You can find the communion elements between your seats. As you grab those, would you stand? On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, Jesus was eating with his friends. And during dinner, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Whenever you eat it, remember me. Let's take and eat and remember Jesus. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took a cup and he said, this is my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, remember me. Let's remember the sacrifice of Jesus and drink. Jesus, thank you. Thank you, thank you for giving your life to make a way for us to be with you. We honor that sacrifice, Jesus. We glorify you and we praise you. King Jesus, would you live and reign in us and through us for your glory? We ask this in your name, amen. Amen, well, as you take a seat, would you turn and say good morning to the folks around you? Well, good morning and welcome to Church of the City. My name is Brad and I'm one of the pastors here. We have a whole team of pastors and staff in our lobby after service. If you are new here and you have questions or if you're not new here and you have questions or if you're looking to get more connected or if you have questions about anything you see or hear or experience today, 
Um, if you look between your seats, you will see a card, and that card has a QR code on it. You can scan that QR code to get all the latest information on things happening in and around our church. I want to point out a few things there to you. The first is that if you would like to give, you can scan the QR code. You can also visit cotc.com slash give. We are able to do so many of the incredible things we do because of your continued faithfulness and generosity in giving. Thank you. The mission statement of Church of the City is practicing the way of Jesus. And we don't believe that's something that you can do alone. It's not something you're meant to do alone. And some of you have been around our church for a while and you found community and connection through maybe a serving team or people you sit near on Sundays or maybe through a community group. But particularly for those of you who have not yet connected, I have several opportunities to connect that I wanna let you know about. The first one is today at three o'clock. We have our next stakeholders gathering. Stakeholders are what we call members at Church of the City. And so you can sign up for this at the QR code, come to stakeholders and you'll hear all about the story of our church, the history of our church. You'll learn about our vision and mission. You'll meet some of our pastors and you'll have an opportunity to learn what it means to be a stakeholder and how you can take next steps to be more connected to the life of Church of the City. The second opportunity to connect is also happening today. We have a growing number of people in our church who are over 40 and single. Some of them have gone through divorce, others have experienced the loss of a spouse and others are never married. If that's you, I wanna invite you to join us tonight immediately following the 5 p.m. service. We're gonna have a connection gathering just down the hallway. We'll have some light snacks and have an opportunity for you to meet some other people as well as talk about how you can find greater connection at Church of the City. That's tonight, right after the 5 p.m. service. Thirdly, last fall, we did a series of men's gatherings on Friday mornings outside up the hill, uh, kind of at the corner of the property. And we got such incredible feedback, we're gonna do that again. And so starting next Saturday, men, bring a camp chair, Bring your Bible, 7 a.m. We're gonna gather up there. We're also gonna have coffee and donuts. And so it would be a tragedy at an early morning men's gathering to run out of coffee and donuts. So if you could use the QR code to register and let us know you're coming, we look forward to seeing you Saturday morning. Now, you may have noticed on your way in this morning, there is construction equipment here now. Yeah. And construction barriers have gone up as we begin to make visible progress on the village. Well, I wanna let you know that starting two weeks from today, the 28th, we will no longer be able to park on the east lawn. So we have plenty of parking in the south lot, but if you're used to parking on the east lawn, that will not be available to us in two weeks. And I wanna let you know, there also may be some golf carts appearing in the near future to shuttle people from the edges of the parking lot to the main entrances. And to help with these upcoming changes to our parking lot, we need to grow our parking team. And this is the final connection opportunity I wanna let you know about. If you're not already serving somewhere, this could be a great time and a great chance to get involved. If we can grow this team, then we can make the Sunday experience for everyone coming onto our property the best that it can be. And you get to wear a very cool, very bright yellow vest if you serve on the parking team. So if you're willing to help, or if you just wanna learn more about what it means to serve on that team, scan the QR code. The final thing I wanna let you know about is the Think Culture Summit, which is coming up on April 24th and 25th at the Fisher Center in Nashville. Think is a longtime Church of the City partner who has helped us think well about how to live a life of faithfulness to God in our modern culture. And so for these couple days later this month, 1,500 leaders are gonna to gather to hear more than 30 speakers talk about a number of timely and incredible topics. So we have a special rate if you're a part of Church of the City, which you can access by scanning the QR code. If you were with us last week, you heard Pastor Darren talk about how excited he was today to launch a brand new series. Well, a few days ago, Pastor Darren was moving firewood and he locked up his lower back. And so he is at home resting, he is recovering, he's already feeling better, but he is unable to be with us today. And I'm excited to tell you that instead of Darren today, we are gonna have a guest speaker. 
a guest as in he's not spoken before, but he is a part of our church. His name is Pastor Tim Harlow. Tim was the pastor of Parkview Christian Church in Chicago for 33 years. He and his family arrived at Parkview when there were only 150 or so attendees and they grew Parkview to multiple locations, thousands of people around the south side of Chicago. And last year, Tim retired, he moved his family to Franklin, Tennessee, and he has become a part of Church of the City. Now, Pastor Tim has been a friend and mentor to Pastor Darren. And in an age when we hear a lot about pastors who don't finish well, uh, we also just wanna honor Tim for the faithfulness he's shown. After 33 years last year, he stepped down and handed over leadership of Parkview to future generations. So last Easter, Pastor Tim was preaching to thousands of people And this Easter, he was here serving in our kids' ministry. In fact, I heard that when Darren asked him to speak today, Tim said, I'm not sure I can. They might need me in Kid City. (laughs) So would you please welcome Pastor Tim Harlow. This is the first year I was gonna get to watch the Masters. (laughs) Come on. Uh, This this reminds me of a situation, because I know it's awkward, you were expecting like the Holy Spirit and Darren and you got some old guy. But I I know this reminds me of a situation after the Passion of the Christ movie came out, uh, Jim Caviezel, the actor who played Jesus, was making the rounds, kind of uh, going to large churches around the country, um, kind of publicizing his, uh, his audio Bible that he had done, Faith Comes by Hearing, he was Jesus in the audio Bible. So, you know, we, we publicized the heck out of it, just made a big deal, like, hey, Jim Caviezel's coming, and then he got the flu at the last minute, he couldn't come. And, and so, you know, I mean, he came like three weeks later, but the first time, I had to get up and go, hey, I'm sorry. I know you wanted to hear from Jesus, but you're hearing from me. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, we got it right that time. Um, I, I, I mean, it, it is so fun to be able to be here. I mean, basically, if you remember 1987 NFL, I'm the replacement, okay, that's it. And if you were here a few weeks ago and heard Pastor Matt begging for people to work and said, We're so desperate that we have a retired senior pastor in the nursery. Yes, that's me. I'm working in the nursery now. I thought that's where I'd rather be. You know, that's what what I need to do for this season. But the reason that we are in Nashville, Tennessee, Franklin, especially, is because of this. All right. I have seven grandkids and they all live in Franklin, Tennessee now. And yes, some of them are a little weird, but they're all so near <laughs> and dear to me, okay? So, so uh, I, what happened was in 2020, I had one daughter and, and son-in-law and their three kids that lived in Franklin. I had a daughter and son-in-law and their kids in Ventura, California, and a daughter and, and her husband and, a, and one kid in Irvine, California. But then COVID happened. Then Gavin Newsom happened. Thank you, Gavin. I love you so much. <laughs> Anybody else want to want to shout out? Thank you. I love you, buddy. So they all were like, okay, let's all go to Franklin, Tennessee. So my wife and I were close enough to retiring. We were like, okay. And we're from Illinois, right? We have a real winner of a governor there too, okay? <laughs> so we're like, yeah, okay, let's all go be together. And, uh, and Pastor Darren and Brandy were been friends for a long time. And um, we got to be all here together in Franklin, Tennessee. It's really amazing. I never thought it would ever happen. Um, so you might ask, why, why 34 years in, in Chicagoland? Um, it wasn't home. I grew up in Oklahoma. My wife grew up in Missouri. We're used to a climate that has spring, so we like it here a lot better. But God literally called us there. And, and I, I kind of felt like, you know, whenever it would be like this time of year and still be snowing in Chicago, I, I, was, I just would remind myself, you know, Jesus didn't want to come to earth. I don't think, you know, I mean, that, that's just me. I, I don't think he wanted to come to earth. And, and he stayed here for 33 years. So I figured 
If he can do it, so can I. And I stayed in Illinois for the same amount of time Jesus was on the earth, and now we have ascended to heaven. Can I get an amen from you? Hallelujah. Yes. And yes, we are the poster children for why your chiropractor is so expensive you can't afford him anymore, okay? That's, that's all of this, okay? So, so we're here together, but the reason that God called us to Chicago, and seriously, um, it was because it, it was just a great match. But seriously, I miss it like you can't possibly imagine, pouring my life into those people and into that place and then, and then walking away. It's hard. It's been one of the hardest seasons of our life. But we felt like it was time for the next generation. We felt, and God's got other things for me and my wife to do besides be grandparents. And, and we're working on all of that. But you know what? Um, it was hard. I'm just going to tell you. And th- because the reason that it was such a great match for us is that Jesus called me and us to be on mission. And he called us to be on mission with people that are far from God. I mean, he, he did that for everybody, but like I have this print in my dining room right now by C.T. Studd, which is just a cool, cool name anyway. Some wish to live within the sound of the chapel bell, but I want to run a mission a yard from the gates of hell. Nothing wrong with the chapel bell. I mean, that's important. We need churches everywhere. But for me, my heart, it was, a, it, was a, it was a mission a yard from the gates of hell. And, and so that's what we did. That's just who God made me to be. So the first season of my life was about, of our life, was about building a church that could be like that. And now the next season is going to be about helping other churches figure out how to do it as well. Because, and here's where this gets into the message, as a pastor's kid growing up in Oklahoma, I realized that there was a huge disconnect between the church that my dad was pastoring and my non-Christian friends. Anybody else experienced that growing up? You know, like I would never invite my non-Christian friends to come to my church. It was a good church. It was a solid church, but they just wouldn't get anything out of it. And back then, Christianity was all about huddling up in our own little churches and our own youth groups. And we had our own schools and our own radio stations. And at one point during my college years, there were even people going around telling us that we needed to listen to only Christian music and that we should burn our non-Christian records. Anybody remember that? Yeah. And I know, I know I'm dating myself. The young people are like, how do you burn music? I don't even, I, I don't, I, that, that doesn't compute. Well, we had these discs made of vinyl, okay? And uh, when you burned them, they kind of shriveled. They were really cool looking. I never did it because I didn't buy into it, but they were doing this. And, and, and in the, I think, dumbest season of Christianity ever, not only were they telling us to burn our records because the, the lyrics were bad or whatever, it was because if you played the record backwards, <laughs> yeah, some of you were there, right? You would hear a subliminal message from Satan. And I got to tell you, I tried and I tried. I wanted to hear the message from Satan. I couldn't get my turntable to go backwards. And I thought the whole thing was goofy. And then when they got to the Eagles Hotel California record, I put my foot down. I'm like, no, you're crazy. I would never burn that. That's the best album ever. Can I, can I get a hallelujah? Okay, come on. So, so, so the problem I kept running into was that it felt like the goal of the church, and again, it's, not my, it's nothing on my dad or on the ministry, or this is just what church was like back in that day. But the goal of the church that I read in the Bible was never to go hide from the world. I'm not saying that it's bad for us to meet together. I love that we're all here. I love Christian music. I love my Church of the City small group that usually sits here in the back right there during this, during this, this service. I love all of that. I love that my grandkids are in Christian preschools and that my daughters went to Christian colleges. I love that. What I'm saying is it's not the goal. Jesus said, go in all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. The goal is to go, not to stay, Right? Jesus said, maybe you've heard this one, you are the salt of the earth, the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden, neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. 
What's the problem? Well, the problem is we keep our light hidden. We keep our salt in the salt shaker, and that's the opposite of what Jesus told us to do. So what's the problem? Well, if you ask me, the problem is not Jesus. The problem is with the church. And I will say right up front, you got to know, I wouldn't be at this church if I thought that was a problem here. But as I told the worship team backstage, we've always got to keep reminding ourselves of this. The problem is not Jesus, it's the church. We can become inwardly focused. Because here's what, I, here's what I mean. When the world thinks of Jesus and his love for people that are outside the kingdom of God, they picture this, right? They picture Jesus on a cross dying for them. But I feel like a lot of times when the world thinks about the church, this is the image that they more likely have. There's a scarecrow out in front of the building trying to keep all the bad birds away. It feels like the world, to the, to the world, the church is trying to scare them away instead of inviting them in. One illustration, when Katy Perry came on the scene, she came on with a very controversial uh, song, you know, and um, one pastor somewhere in Ohio decided to use his church sign to talk about it, okay? This is what he put. I kissed a girl and I liked it, and then I went to hail. I'm sorry, I have to say hail like that, okay? And notice the little lamb up in the corner, all right? Really, really great, yep. I, I, I mean, my, my, listen, I'm not arguing the theology of human sexuality. I, I'm staying completely away from that. I'm just certain that no little lost lamb from the LGBTQ plus community drove by that sign and thought, hmm, I think I'll go in there and find out how much God loves me. Am I right? <laughs> and, 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 and I've done it too. When, when I was in Bible college, you might be surprised to know that I wasn't in the holy group, okay? I was in the dean's office more than I was in the holy group group, okay? But, and I'm dating myself again, just forgive me, but there was a concert. I went to college in Joplin, Missouri. Okay? So if there was a concert from somebody famous, they were already washed up, right? Joplin, Missouri, okay? And Alice Cooper was coming. Okay, so many young people don't even, don't even get this. It, Alice Cooper was coming and some of the people in the holy group at, at Bible college decided that for some reason that they would go and picket Alice Cooper concert at, at the arena. And somehow there must've been a, a girl there I was interested in or something because somehow I ended up going with them. And, and I remember us standing there and some of them had signs. I, to this day, I don't know what the signs could have said. Alice is a girl's name or you're singing about the devil or you know, whatever. I don't know what it was. And I remember that, that the people in the holy group were yelling at the people standing in line and the people standing in line were yelling at us. And I, and I thought to myself, I don't think this is helping. I don't think this is making a difference. And I know that Alice Cooper is a committed Christian to this day, but I guarantee you it had nothing to do with a bunch of Bible college students in Joplin, Missouri, picketing his concert because he was loved to Jesus. But that's what church became about for me and for a lot of us. And it still does to this day. The church can become about the things that we're against instead of the things that we're for. We used to say it, we don't drink, smoke, or chew, or go with girls who do in Oklahoma. You heard that before? <laughs> we don't drink, smoke, or chew, or go with girls who do, right? That was, that was our deal, okay? But somewhere along the way, I started actually studying the life of Jesus. And do you know what I found out? Jesus never picketed anybody. Jesus was never a scarecrow. He was the opposite of a scarecrow. Jesus came to invite people into a relationship with the Father and not just the ones who followed the rules. As a matter of fact, ironically, the only time that Jesus got mad, I wrote a book about it, the only time that Jesus got mad was at the scarecrows. That's the only time. The religious people who were standing in front saying, you're not worthy to come in here. And instead, what did Jesus do? He spent a lot of time with Alice Cooper and Katy Perry and the Eagles. Jesus said, compel them to come in. Jesus said, be my witnesses. Jesus said, go into all the world. 
not stand at the entrance and decide if they're good enough. And he said this, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners. So I made up a term for what I think the problem is. Um, and it's, it's this, it's gracism. Gracism. It's not about the color of your skin, it's about the color of your sin. Isn't that really what the problem is? I mean, is it, 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 what, to me it felt like, well, you know, we don't do these things and those people do do those things, so we're better than them. That's the problem with the church. And anytime that you talk to anybody and try to invite them into a relationship where you think you're better than they are, it's just really not gonna work, is it? It's gracism. So to quote the famous theologian Miranda Lambert, I think it's this way. I heard Jesus, he drank wine, and I bet we'd get along just fine. He could calm a storm and heal the blind, and I bet he'd understand a heart like mine. I'm not kidding. That is great theology. Now the tax collectors and sinners were gathering around to hear him, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, the scarecrows, muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Is that what he did? Oh yeah, over and over. Let me just pull out one example for you today. His name is Matthew. Backstory is he's a tax collector, okay? He's a a guy who sold out to, to Rome. He's a Jew, but he sold out to Rome and he rips people off by charging them the proper taxes and then adding more to it because you couldn't say no to him and and taking the money for himself. Probably they were the most hated category of people in Jerusalem at the time, okay? That would have been true. And and Jesus comes upon Matthew one day and, 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 and he tells a story later that would illustrate what a relationship between a tax collector and God would be. And I just want you to hear this. This is a separate story, but here's how I believe Matthew would have felt as Jesus was walking up to him. Two men went to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. You ever heard somebody do that in church? You know, oh God. I thank you that I'm not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. Evidently, there was also a tax collector there. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all I get. And I think Jesus was just like, okay, shut up. We're done. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. God have mercy on me, a sinner. That's how a tax collector would have felt. That's how any tax collector would have felt if he was around religion in any way. And here's what I wanna just say from that. I believe that the farther a person is from God, the more they realize they need him. I don't think we need to yell at him. I don't think we need a marquee. I don't think we need a picket line. I don't think we need to post it on social media. I think they already know. He stood at a distance because, and this is just a fact from history, tax collectors weren't even allowed to come into the temple. The scarecrow religious leaders of Jesus' day had set up rules that said, if you're a tax collector, you can't even come in. That's what should make the story of Matthew so striking. So let's go back. Jesus went on from there. He saw a man named Matthew sitting at a tax collector's booth and said, follow me. And Matthew got up and followed him. All right? Just, just imagine you're, with the, you're one of the disciples at this point, okay? And you see this lousy jerk of a guy. You can't stand him. He's a crook and you're thinking to yourself, he steals from his own people and he liked that and he went to hell. That's the sign that you want to put up right there, right? You really hate this guy. And then you hear Jesus say, follow me. And it just blows your mind for a minute. And then you got to start getting a little bit angry, right? Wait a minute. Follow me means come with us. We don't want this tax collector with his Hotel California music hanging out with us. 
that may have been, they may have been lowly fishermen, but in the gracism list of those who deserve to be with God, they are still above tax collectors, right? I mean, they had this caste system, and I guarantee you this is how it would have been. In a gracism list, it would have gone something like this. You had the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. They would have been at the top because they told everybody they were at the top. And then you would have had like medical professionals because you got to respect and love what they do. And then you would have had normal people, and then you would have had fishermen. They were below normal people because they stank, because they were fishermen, right? And that's who most of the disciples are. And then under that, you would have a center category, okay? But then the sinner category, there were worse sinners because they talked about it a lot. There were prostitutes and there were tax collectors and there were Cub fans, okay? That, there you go, <laughs> right? Isn't that the list in your mind? Okay, yeah, okay, all right, we got, we got one. Uh, but, but what I'm saying is as fishermen, having tax collectors in their group is not gonna help their status. Imagine how excited they were one day when Jesus invited Dr. Luke to join their group. Oh, wait, that's, that goes up. Matthew's a step down. Nobody wants their Instagram picture with a tax collector, right? I was with Pastor Rick Warren one time. We were talking about getting American pastors over to Africa to a project that we were doing. And we were talking about how to get them over there. And then at one point, Pastor Rick just goes, I might invite Bono to come. I'm like, dude, you invite Bono to come, every pastor in America is going to come to Africa. I mean, it's not hard, right? I mean, that's all you need. You wanna be with the people that are more important, not less important. And hey, church, here's a question for you. I mean, you, you saw that verse a minute ago. Jesus said, follow me, he told him, and Matthew got up and followed him. Did Jesus say anything else? I mean, we don't, there's nothing else recorded here, but please remember who wrote this? Matthew. This is his gospel, okay? All we know is that Jesus said, follow me. What's my point? My point is, Jesus didn't give him a punch list. Shouldn't Jesus have said, okay, follow me, and here's the deal, you need to change your life completely right now. We're Christians. We don't drink, smoke, or chew, or go with girls who do. You understand this, right? You need to quit your tax collecting. You need, you, you, you need to turn from sin. You need to repent. You, we, you, we don't have any of that in there. And I feel like Matthew would have said something. Why is there no record of that? I think it's because Jesus was, in, was not inviting him to a religion. He was inviting him to a relationship. Do you think maybe Matthew already knew he had some issues? Stood at a distance and beat his breast and said, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And then in another moment where, you know, <laughs> I wish the Bible told us more information, the next verse just says, while Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house. That's it. That's, that's all we've got. We don't know anything. What happened? My guess is that Matthew said, yeah, of course I'll follow you. And Jesus said, okay, great. And Matthew said, what do we do next? And Jesus said, I'm hungry. And Matthew said, come over to my house. I got an awesome house and a lot of food because I steal from people. <laughs> and Jesus said, okay, I will go get, I will go eat your stolen food with you. And Matthew said, well, can I invite my friends? And Jesus said, yeah, of course you can invite your friends. And guess what kind of friends Matthew had? <laughs> Sinner friends, right? So Jesus, please understand scripture, went to a sinner party. I imagine the conversations at Matthew's house. He'd heard, his friends had heard about Jesus and they're like, how did Matthew get Jesus here? And Matthew is running around and he's, he's just listening to the conversations and he's restocking the beer cooler and there's non-Christian music on the stereo. I woke up on the wrong side of the truck bed this morning. Cause he, he hasn't heard of Chris Tomlin yet. He doesn't even know that the Christian radio stations exist, okay? And that's where Jesus is. And 
many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him, Jesus, and his disciples. It was the Bible's way of saying Jesus was at a naughty people party. And when the Pharisees saw this, they asked the disciples, why is your teacher at a naughty people party? I mean, this is so obviously morally offensive, it doesn't make any sense. Have they changed yet? Why would he be associating with them before they made these changes to their life that would make them holy enough to be able to stand in the presence of God? And this is where Jesus responds to them saying, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, it's the sick. And then he throws a dig at them. I promise you guys. He says, but go and learn what this means. In other words, you're ignorant. Go figure this out. And then he throws a scripture at them from the Old Testament that they knew. Go learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. In other words, right up front, I want you to know that my goal here is not to make fake little holy people that hang out in their little church boxes and burn their devil music. I'm here for the sinners. In Luke 14, Jesus launches into a parable about the banquet. I want you to listen to this in relationship to the kingdom of God because that's what it's for. A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, come for everything is ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. So the servant came back and reported this to his master. And then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and the alleys of the town and bring in the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. If those people don't wanna come, let's go get everybody else. And sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there is still room. So the master told his servant, go out to the roads and the country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. Those people who play the games and keep the rules and think they're healthy, they're gonna miss out. But the sick, the, the Matthews, the people who don't really have a right to be here, they will get a spot at the table. And guess what? You and I are sinners, we're sick, we're Matthews, we don't deserve to be there either, and we will get a spot at the table. And guess what else? Your friends and your neighbors, those people you work with, that maybe sometimes you kind of look down your nose at because they live this way or they do these things or whatever, there's a spot at the banquet table for them too. All we have to do is let our light shine, let our salt be applied in a healthy way that they will see our lives and glorify our Father in heaven. Now, being a pastor, I was a pastor for 40 years, all, all told, um, it's really hard to be around non-Christians, especially when you get to be a large church and you've got staff that you deal with and all those kinds of things. It's hard to be around non-Christians. So that's why I had to purposely make a, a place for me to be around non-Christian people because I knew that was my calling. And I, I have, if I'm gonna exemplify it to the church, I, I, gotta, I gotta live it. I gotta model it, right? So I would always work out at a health club, okay? That was one thing that I would always do could work out in the basement or whatever, but I always worked out at a health club. And, and one day in between walking in between, you know, some weight equipment, I, I walked around this guy, Mike. Um, he's a ex hells angel. He paints bikes for a living. He can bench press a small truck, obviously, right? And I didn't really know him. I didn't think he knew me. And I, I just said, and, and this is important for you to, you might even want to write this down. If you're going to have a relationship with people that are far away from God, this is a great opening line. Are you ready? I said, hey man, how you doing? I know, it's pretty good, isn't it? It's right up there with, if you died tonight, would you go to heaven? But no, it's, it's, 
it's even better, okay? Hey man, how you doing? And he literally said, I'm not doing too good. I should probably talk to you. <laughs> like, okay, guess he knows who I am. And, and so I gave him my phone number and we started talking and um, he was not doing good. He was cheating on his second wife. His kids were a mess because of all of it. And over the course of time, Mike and I got to be friends. I kind of dug into some of the reasons why he was the way that he was. But one of the things we did was we started working out together, which is kind of cool, you know, work out with that guy. Hurt a lot, but it was kind of cool. <laughs> and except that he was a loud mouth, profane human being. Okay, and I'm in a public health club. So any woman that's in there, he's making gestures, he's, he's talking about her. And then one day, I promise you, he walked in, in a, to, to, to the locker room in a strip club t-shirt. And I don't know if there are good strip club t-shirts and bad strip club t-shirts, but this was definitely a bad strip club t-shirt. And I'm like, dude, you can't work out in that. Why not? I like this shirt. Because half the people in here go to my church. Everybody knows who I am. I can't work out with you like that. He's like, I'm not changing it. And he wouldn't change it. And I had a decision to make. What was I going to do? And I decided to be like Jesus. And I went out and I worked out with him. I mean, I definitely was like, chance I got so that, you know, people from my church couldn't see it if they didn't have to. But then it hit me, you know what? If church people are talking bad about me, I'm like Jesus. How cool is that? If I'm supposed to be a disciple of Jesus, and remember our mantra here at Church of the City, right? We're, we're, we're developing in the pathway of Jesus. That's what we're doing. We're trying to be more like Jesus. Have you ever thought about it from this perspective before? If I'm supposed to be a disciple of Jesus, I should look like him. So I ended up with a phone full of the most expletive laden text messages that you've ever known. And, and I spent a lot of work with him. And he had a lot of stuff. But eventually, he decided to come to the banqueting table. And I got to baptize him. And he became a, a great story of things that were going on in our church and in our life. Yeah, it took two of us. I, I'm only showing you that because I want to tell you the rest of the story. He got baptized. He got his life straightened out for a little bit. And then he got his life screwed up again. And now he's fled the country because he's, if he comes back here, he'll be arrested. Okay. And, and the reason I tell you that is because it's messy. Doing ministry to people that are far away from God is messy. The problem with sinners is that they're messy. And I think the biggest reason that most churches and most Christians tend to shy away from sinners and tax collectors is because they're scary and they're messy. But Jesus said, I came for the sick. So it's better for us just to admit that we're also sick and forget about the gracism thing and grow up and realize that everybody needs Jesus and invite them in and become friends with them. Our church in Chicago was in Tinley Park suburb, and then it moved to Orland Park before we went multi-site. And so we decided we needed to change the name from what it was, and, and we wanted to keep the park in the name. And I voted for South Park, and nobody would do it. <laughs> South Suburbs Park, I thought it was great, but nobody wanted it. And somebody suggested Park View. So if you want to know why the church is called Park View today, it's because when I heard Parkview, it had a hospital connotation to me. It had a medical connotation to me. Classic Johnny Carson, uh, Johnny Cash, Johnny Carson, a classic Johnny Cash song, right? 
And Porter Wagner did it also called Committed to Parkview about Porter Wagner being in the Parkview Mental Hospital and how messed up things were. And that's exactly what the church is supposed to be. And I wanna tell you something. If, if you just walked in here today and you're not sure if this is the right place for you and, and, and you feel like you're far away from God, I hope you just heard that this is the place for you. We love you. We want to help you find Jesus. And if you're a Christian like me and you've been a Christian for a really, really long time, please hear this message as a reminder that we can't become like that older brother in the prodigal son story. We have to be like the father and run to welcome those who've been far away. That all became more real to me as a dad. You know, start to put yourself in the, in, the, in the place of God the Father and realize that Matthew and everybody else is far away and they're lost and you miss them. Have you ever lost a kid? My, our worst story um, was Becca, who's now a part of this church, but when she was four, she got lost on a beach in North Carolina and we were together with a bunch of the cousins and a bunch of the family, and she was only four. She was the youngest one out of all of them. And she got separated from the cousins somehow, and, and, and we didn't know what happened to her. And this is before the age of cell phones, so, so you're always at a disadvantage in that regard. And so we went and alerted the, the lifeguards immediately, and they started walkie-talkie to everybody else saying, hey, there's a little brown-haired girl in a pink Barbie bathing suit that's lost somewhere on the beach. And I told everybody to stay where they were, and I said, I'm going to run south on the beach, and Denise, you can run north. My wife, you can run north on the beach because nobody's gonna run faster than the two parents who are missing their child, right? Because you can imagine all the things. You, you know the ocean's there. You know there's a lot of people. It was a holiday weekend. And so I started running and I ran. I got down to that place on the sand where the, the water meets the sand and I ran like nobody has ever run before. And every once in a while I'd stop and say, hey, have you seen a little dark haired girl in a pink Barbie bathing suit? And they would say no. And I would keep running and I would keep running. And finally I saw her. You know what, you know what that does to your heart? Just imagine you're God. And that's one of your other lost children. But, but you know, as a parent, what you're, you've got all this pent up anxiety and all, all these emotions going. And so what your natural tendency is going to be is to just yell at her, right? Becca, what were you thinking? But as a semi-responsible parent, you know, you can't really do that, right? Because she's probably already scared enough. So it was like, hi, Becca. What you doing down here? <laughs> and I promise you, she turned and looked at me. And what did she do? She started crying. Because she knew she was lost. I didn't need to yell at her. I didn't need a marquee. I didn't need a picket sign. I didn't need to post on social media. She knew she was lost. My responsibility was to pick her up and to hug her and to love her, which I did for about one second. And then I realized, wait, her mom's dying a slow death on the other side, <laughs> right? Waiting for news that Becca's okay. And I didn't even, I promise you, I never thought of it at the time. But the smartest thing I thought I could do was to hoist her up on my shoulders and start running. And I've thought about that since. How many times have you seen that beautiful picture of Jesus with the little lost lamb over his shoulders, right? That's exactly what I did. I put her on and I ran just as fast back to her mom because a parent whose child is lost, their heart is broken. They want that lost child to come home. And if that's you, I guarantee you, God wants you to come home. We're gonna have a prayer team up here. If you'd like to pray with somebody today, if you'd like to talk to one of us, 
We'll have the prayer team up here also, just in case there's something else for you to pray for. Or maybe God's convicting you today. You know what? There's a person I've maybe been a little gracious with in my life, and I need to knock that off and be their friend. Maybe God's just saying, hey, I think you should be shining the light over here, over there. You want to pray for some, with somebody, there's, there's somebody up here for you. And I want to pray for all of us. Um, I just believe that there are a lot of people around us who need Jesus. And I want to run a chapel. I want to run a mission, a yard from the gates of hell, and hell is all around us. And that's what we're doing at Church of the City. I hope you'll join us. Father, thank you for a reminder as a father what it's like to lose your child. Um, And sometimes that child doesn't look like me. Sometimes they don't act like me. And I needed that reminder that you love them. Lord, if that person that's far away from you is here listening, even online, Lord, I, I pray that you'll help them to understand that this is a place that loves them doesn't judge them. We love them. Lord, so many of them around. Lord, I want to pray for Darren that you'll help his back get better because we all want to learn about the Holy Spirit next week, doing what he does, be with his back. I just pray that you'll be with this church. Let us be a hospital for the sick. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Would you stand with me? May the Lord bless us and keep us. May he make his face shine upon us and be gracious to us. May the Lord lift his countenance upon us and give us peace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with us now and forever. Amen. Have a great weekend, everybody. Have fun watching the Masters.